traction. Um, you may have uh, read today in the Washington Post an interesting quote that begins, income inequality is the defining issue of our time. That was our president today. He, <laughs> he, he went on to say, he went on to say, this is a make or break moment for the middle class and for all those who are fighting to get into the middle class. At stake is whether this will be a country where working people can earn enough to raise a family, build a modest savings, own a home, and secure their retirement. I think that's a great quote. I'd like to see something more than a modest savings, but I think the sentiment is right. And I'm delighted that the administration has apparently gotten the word that income and wealth inequality are essential defining issues of our time. Our speaker tonight, Gar Alperwitz, has known that and has been working on that for more than four decades. Um, Gar's book, America Beyond Capitalism, if there's anybody here from the administration, I'd highly recommend you read it. Because, <laughs> because now that we know this is a defining moment, it would be good to know what in the world to do about the problem we have. And that's what this book and that's what this night's about. So tonight we're going to hear from the author, Gar Alperwitz, who's going to speak to you about some of the major themes of the, of the work. Um, our friend, our good friend, Ralph Nader, is going to provide some comments about this issue and what he's heard tonight. And then at the end, John Cavana of the Institute for Policy Studies is going to kind of make like Oprah Winfrey and take a microphone in the audience and you ask the questions and we'll respond as best we can. So with that, I'd like to introduce Gar Alperwitz, the uh, co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative, a great friend and truly a brilliant public intellectual. Gar. Hey. Uh, thank you, Ted, and, and thank you for so many people coming out in the rain. Really uh, appreciate it. But I know the subject, America, is this, how's the sound? Okay back there? Yeah. Yep. The, uh, the subject matter, America beyond capitalism, I think is the question. And so I want to sharpen the, question, the issue this way, just for openers. I'm going to give you just a feel for the book. It took 25 to 30 years of hard work, state by state by state by state, when the women vote finally came to fruition. It was more than 40 years. But it finally reached the national level. If you look at what happened in the New Deal, in many, many states, Labor law was changed, the, the pension laws, the beginnings of Social Security were done in the states and localities, step by step by step, and they began finally, when the moment was right, to transform the national system. So I'd like you to hold that in mind as we begin to talk about some of the things we've been finding on the ground and what is at the heart of this book. Let me talk a bit first about not income distribution, about wealth distribution. Income distribution is extremely concentrated. The top 1% has got more income than the bottom half of the society. But wealth, that is the ownership of factories and businesses and houses and so forth, the top 400 individuals, the top 400 individuals have more wealth than the bottom 60% of the society taken together. If you measure it another way, the top 5% five, five have 70% of the investment capital. Any way you cut it, this is a society that is structured in terms of owning the productive wealth of the society that is medieval. And I don't mean that term rhetorically. The power is so concentrated in wealth ownership, in who owns the corporations, who owns the businesses, that that power structure is technically medieval. Now the question is, is there an alternative to that that might, like the progressive era, like the women's movement, begin slowly, steadily in a time of great, great pain when people are opening up, thanks in part to the great work of occupies around the country, lights are going on, that there is indeed something fundamentally wrong and that it's time to really reassess where we're going. So one of the questions posed in this book, and we cover a great deal of detail in it, is what is there that might, 
one day slowly build up and begin to give ideas for the national transformation at some point. And if you look below what the, what the press covers, and the press partly doesn't care and partly doesn't have the resources to cover, let me tell you just a little bit about what's out there that moves in a totally different direction. Instead of elite ownership of the productive wealth, the alternative obviously is to democratize in one way or another, democratizing who owns wealth in the society. So if you look below the surface, what you find is roughly 120 million Americans are members of co-ops and credit unions. Most people don't know that. 140% of the society is already involved in something like a credit union or a co-op. There are roughly 11,000 worker-owned companies. 13 million people are already involved in workers owning their own businesses in one form or another. Six million more than are members of labor unions in the, in the United States today in the private sector. If you look further, there are hundreds of land trusts, publicly owned, community owned land where housing can be developed to make profits for community groups rather than for business, businesses to take the profits out. In a number of states, we're finding states that are investing, 27 of them, and have public ownership of parts of the businesses. You don't see this in the press, but it is another form of democratizing wealth. There are 4,500 neighborhood corporations that use wealth to help the communities. You probably couldn't see this either. If you look around the country, there is a developmental process underway. And the reason it's underway is partly historic. Another part of it, for instance, historically, 30% of the land surface in the United States is already owned by the government. It's publicly owned, 30% of the land. I'll give you one more statistic and I'll stop and you'll get the idea. 25% of electric generation is public utilities or co-ops. 25% in the United States of America. Socialized electrical production is conventional. It's common, it's everywhere, but it's not talked about from the perspective of who actually owns the wealth and the productive resources. So one of the propositions, and one of the arguments of the book is that if you look deeply, you will find the elements, the ingredients, the kinds of things that can be built up over time and are already far more widespread and very, very ordinary in ordinary life, but they aren't understood as potential ingredients like the slow buildup of the women's vote or like the pre-New Deal period where the principles were developed and became part and parcel of a national dialogue. So one part of the book is simply to give you a sense of what's out there. A second part, and I offer you a little larger perspective on that, is to ask questions about what might be if we extend some of these principles. Now, the work we've done in Cleveland with Ted has done the leadership work and Steve Dove has done a great deal of work on a model that shows you how you can move forward advancing from one principle to the next principle. So let me tell you a little bit about the, the interesting parts of this cooperative mix in Cleveland. It is a complex of worker-owned cooperatives linked together with a nonprofit corporation that aims to build the community, not just to make a few workers rich, and a revolving fund. Some of you know about the Mondragon Corporation and the Basque Country, which is a very large 100,000 person cooperative based on those principles as well. But much more interesting, using the purchasing power of public and quasi-public institutions, hospitals and universities, to help stabilize this. So it's a model that moves towards economic planning at the local level, but changing who owns the wealth and democratizing it. That's an advancing model, and indeed many cities are now beginning to consider moving forward in a way that changes, democratizes, puts in worker ownership, owning the productive resources rather than the 1%, and many people, conservatives, liberals, and radicals, begin to see this makes sense. I had an interesting experience talking to, by their invitation, of the Chamber of Commerce of one of the suburbs in this area about this kind of a model. And to a man and to a woman, it made sense to them to keep the resources here, stabilize the tax base, might even help some small businessmen. And that evening I was talking to radical organizers in Baltimore in exactly the same response. If we can democratize, building from the bottom up, 
and changing the principles we begin to think about as conventional. Much of this is as American as apple pie if we extend it and if we build it up. So the next second point about this, and I'm not going to give you a full long lecture tonight about this, but one of the conditions that produce more and more development politically is the growing pain and the growing failure and the growing loss of alternatives. So if you go to a city like Cleveland or if you go to Youngstown, Ohio or, or parts of the Midwest, I'm from Wisconsin, you will see that there are no specific alternatives available for cities to develop and for people without jobs and there are no answers and people know that. That's the time when people begin looking for new alternatives and they are beginning to say we have to try something new and these opportunities, these new things that are available to people become potentially the groundwork city after city for laying the development of a new possibility over time. Now I'm a historian and a political economist and I'm a realist. I think at most times of history momentum governs and at most times the establishment controls. But not always. But not always. The explosion that was the Occupy movement gives us a sense of what might be and given the likelihood, and we could go into this in discussion, of ongoing, deepening, worsening pain of the kind we've begun to see, given that as a highly likely scenario, the pendulum is unlikely to swing, given that this kind of development and linking it with politics I think is the beginning point of a potentially new progressive era. And when I say a new progressive era, you don't play this game unless you want to throw a couple decades of your life on the table. We're talking about developing serious politics, serious systemic change politics, to change the ownership of wealth in the most powerful advanced corporate capitalist system in the world is to change the system, is to be a long-term process. But what is really interesting about these developments and the ideas that they suggest going forward is they are extremely American, they're highly democratic, they're highly localized, and they give us an answer to the question, if you don't like corporate capitalism and you don't like state socialism, what do you want? And what we're beginning to see in a very American way, and it's, and it's an exciting way if you visit some of these projects, are the beginning ingredients of a very, very decentralized, different way to own in practical and efficient and politically viable ways ownership of wealth and production. I want to go just a short, one short or two sentences more on this and then we'll pass it on to Ralph and we'll have a longer discussion about this. Most people, I think, don't see themselves as historical actors. People are interested in, quote, politics or maybe a project or what I sometimes call project by project, projectism. The question was raised by this and it's an existential question. I'm talking really to the person sitting in your seat. You. The existential question is not whether or not the elements of a new possibility exist. It is whether individually we can rise to the possibility of grasping an opportunity and beginning to see ourselves historically in that sense. Building over time is a historical process and it requires a sense of who we are that sees that world that way. What I think is really interesting is an American beyond capitalism offers that challenge and that possibility and potentially that extremely exciting option. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gar. Ted. John, uh, I want to amplify a little bit what uh, Gar was saying. Uh, I grew up in a small textile uh, town in Connecticut. It was a quintessential. There were red brick factories producing clocks, hosiery, textiles of very kind, pins, uh, you, you name it. They're all gone now. So when I was growing up, the talk in town was, what do the factory owners think? What are the factory owners will let us do? Where are the factory owners going to do with our future? They're gone. That power is now gone, and there's a big vacuum. When I used to go to Cleveland, you, you, you had to head for the airport, 
long ahead of time because there'd be a crossing uh, because there's so many factories. Uh, and you'd often have to line up to get over the railroad crossing. Now the biggest employer is Cleveland Clinic, right? Yeah. The biggest employer in many towns is the university or in some small towns like in upstate New York, the prisons. Now, we haven't gotten used to that vacuum. In city after city, we don't have to worry about the factory owners anymore. They've abandoned our country. They haven't just gone from New England to Alabama or Mississippi or South Carolina with the textile equipment on flatbed trucks. They're gone. And, that, and, that, and we haven't gotten used to, hey, the oppressors are gone. The people who control City Hall are gone. Now, there's always someone who controls City Hall uh, in terms of commercial interests. But we haven't gotten used to this vacuum, which is an opportunity, number one. What kind of opportunity it is, now we can marshal more of our consumer dollars into real power because there are no factory worker dollars to speak of. So we can move our money from the big banks to community banks and credit unions. We can develop farmer to consumer marketplaces. We can find local sources of energy, such as wind power or other local sources with new, new appropriate uh, technology. We can expand community clinics uh, uh, through the cooperative mechanism. But we're not gonna be able to do this if we don't think like active consumer owners Active consumer owners. That's what cooperatives are. Now, Gar mentioned there are, what is it, 80 million, uh, 70 million members of credit unions? Of credit unions. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a lot of people. That includes a lot of right wing people, <laughs> evangelicals, you name it. But the credit unions, which functionally should represent, one, consumer control, and two, a real alternative to commercial banking. Uh, increasingly have mimicked commercial banking. They're not quite as bad, they don't charge penalties as high, bounce check, etc. And that's because the, the members who own the credit union are not active, they're not participating. So management runs the credit union. So we've got to think more of what we do with our money and how, how we become more active consumer owners, and then what we're doing is building a, a sub-economy underneath the globalized economy that is flitting all over the world, looking for the cheapest labor, the most corrupt government, uh, and where the deals can be cut, and then trying to send the results back here under NAFTA and WTO. The second point I want to make is that we are we own the largest wealth in the U.S. Uh, I remember that Professor Wolf at NYU, an uh, expert on wealth inequality, called me up in 2000. And he said, I just came across something. I was crunching numbers. I thought you'd be interested. He said, Bill Gates has the financial wealth equivalent to the bottom 120 million Americans. And just let that sink in. One man. 120 million Americans. The conclusion he drew was not only that Microsoft monopoly led to this based on government research and development, free, uh, created the internet and all that. The other conclusion is that 120 million Americans are essentially broke. Their assets and liabilities, they're in debt. Now the, the, the key point is they're not broke. They own a piece of the greatest wealth in our country called the Commonwealth. <clears throat> they own the public airways. They own the public lands. They own trillions of dollars of pension money. They own trillions of dollars of government R&D that have built the aerospace, the biotech, a lot of the pharmaceutical, the containerization right out of the Navy, containerization industry, uh, the, uh, the semiconductor industry, and so on. One industry after another was built on the backs of taxpayers. And what do we get for that? Because we don't grow up learning that we own the Commonwealth, number one. And if we did grow up in our school systems learning that we own this enormous Commonwealth, and there's much more to it, intellectual property and so forth, 
Uh, then we won't ask the question of our undeserving political party oligopoly or duopoly, why don't we control it? If we own it, why don't we have our own radio and TV s uh, stations and networks? If we control it, why can't we control the disposition and preservation of the public lands onshore and offshore? Trillions of dollars of natural resources. If we own it, why can't we get what Gar has called in his book, the residual payback from all these trillions of dollars that have built all these industries and made people like Bill Gates and others incredibly rich on the back of the taxpayers. So you see, it all comes down to demanding more. It all comes down to higher expectation levels in our various roles instead of looking out for the crumbs. Extend the unemployment, please. Extend the unemployment another six weeks. Uh, how restore restore the food stamps? We own this country, not m metaphorically. We own this country, and we're not getting the residuals. People grow up and they say, "Well, to get a good standard of living, I just better get a good salary and a, and a decent wage or whatever." But they don't say, "Why don't we get the residual on all these investments that are making all these corporate executives rich?" Now in Alaska, they have the, tr the trust fund, you know, the oil trust fund, and they send about $1,800 a year to every person in Alaska because years ago when they discovered oil, someone in the legislature said, well, how are we going to have a return from that other than just some jobs and some uh, saturated uh, lands with, with oil? How are we going to get the residuals? So that's just one example of what's going on and what... Ted and, and, and Gar and others have been doing in Cleveland and elsewhere are simply models that can be massively expanded throughout the United States. Let me tell you, if you can do it in Cleveland, you can do it anywhere. <laughs> so uh, that's a real bombed out city. So <clears throat> this is what this gathering is all about. So when someone asks you, what do you own, in addition to clothing, cars, homes, whatever, add we own a piece of the public airways. We own a piece of the public lands. We own the R&D and just keep going that way. It will then translate into a more edifying political uh, literature and political campaigning and political issues to replace the, uh, the rancid impoverishment of what we're watching on cable TV today in the presidential and congressional races. Okay, you all own America. Now you're going to own this forum. Um, I'm going to just walk around with the microphone. I was picked because I'm good at getting through narrow spaces here. Um, we, I mean, I thank all three of them, of Ted and Gar and Ralph, for their comments. They've kept them short so that we have lots of time for conversation. And then at the end, in about an hour, we'll pause and there's one of these small enterprises that Gar just described out on the other side of the restaurant. It's a terrific nonprofit called Teaching for Change. It's an independent bookstore, and we need more of them. And they are selling America beyond capitalism, and I ask you to go out and buy copies there and bring them back, and, and Gar would be happy to, uh, to sign them. I, Gar didn't say this, and Ted and Ralph didn't say it, so I just want to say one thing about the book. In this book, Gar wrote an earlier version of it seven years ago, and now we have an updated version for today. In the first version, he predicted the crisis. He predicted a movement. He didn't call it Occupy Wall Street. He predicted a movement that would rise up to take on the crisis and the issues in the crisis. And as you've seen, he's provided a lot of pathways forward to change that system and to change that economy. So I think what I'm going to do is I'll go down this side first and take four or five comments. And if you want to try an idea out or you have a question, please keep them short. So we'll take four or five. We'll ask these folks to respond. And then we'll go down this side. And then we'll see if uh, we have people behind us up here if they have any questions. So just let me know if you've, if you've got a comment. We'll start here. Well, being in the front, I guess I, um, 
have the first chance to, uh, to ask a, a question. And <clears throat> it's a question that comes from an interesting perspective because I've been living out of the country for the last two years and just came back within the last two weeks. So I've been reading and looking at the Occupy movement from, from a distance. And one of the things that, that struck me were two things, and, and, and I don't want to sound curmudgeonly, but, but I have to bring these points up. One is that it seemed very unclear to me, reading the media both online and, and in Europe, um, what the movement was about and what its points were and exactly why it was there other than just a genuine pent up frustration about the economic condition. And then the other point was it seemed like the Occupy movement was crushed like a beetle by the establishment when they felt that it was gaining any sort of traction. So my two questions are, one is, can you articulate or can other people here, if they're from the movement, really articulate what the movement was trying to do and what they wanted the American public to, to react to? And second, would you agree that this particular movement had very little power because it could be shut down at any time? Uh, quick answer is no, but we're not going to let you respond. We'll take three or four more. Uh, I'm going to start my uh, question with uh, a fact. Uh, Wells Fargo Bank uh, gets the uh, property taxes that D.C. residents pay. It's put into Wells Fargo Bank. Wells Fargo is also invested in a prison, a private prison, that houses the victims of the drug war that have impoverished much of the uh, east of the river. Uh, and uh, people around the country now, many states are pushing for a public bank like they have in North Dakota. Uh, publicly owned and publicly accountable. And I know a few people here that are interested in that too. So what's your, uh, what's your take on this movement and its potential? Great. Let me get you all the way in the back here. Hi, uh, my name is Catalina, and uh, obviously we're talking about alternatives to capitalism. And um, I mean, I would challenge that to also think about alternatives to imperialism, because we're talking about a system of, of imposing this political and economic system of capitalism into other countries. Um, and I see, like, you know, the co-op movement in the U.S. very much, like, white-dominated. Uh, and um, I'm wondering, uh, in the thinking and analysis that you have about alternatives to capitalism, how much is being informed by, by movements, you know, anti-colonialism uh, movements, uh, anti-capitalist movements from Native Americans here, uh, from, uh, um, for example, people in Argentina that take over factories and, and things like that. So, just would like to hear more about this idea of alternatives to capitalism, but, but really learning from, from a really strong history of, of those movements that we already have, you know, since colonization, pretty much. Okay, we'll take one more over here, and then we'll go back to you. Uh, Reverend Naya Finlay from the faith-based community. And I was a little offended because you were speaking about capitalism as if it's race neutral. And so when you say we, I don't know if I'm included in that we, because black people as a result of capitalism and racism had to develop their own co-ops in their communities. We may not have called them co-ops, but we had to develop our own mean, means of, um, how we fed ourselves, clothed ourselves, and so on and so forth. So I'd like for you to speak more about that and also support the young lady who was uh, asked the previous question about more inclusion, because the Occupy movement is not inclusive in itself. Okay. 
Let's start back with you, Gar. Okay. Um, this is going to be a good discussion. I can see that, uh, that people, are, people are getting the right questions, at least from my perspective. Uh, I don't speak for the Occupy movement. Uh, I think what the Occupy, and I hope, I think there are some people, Kevin, are you here by any chance? There's, uh, there are probably a lot of people who, from the Occupy movement can speak to it. What the movement has done is demonstrated that you can open up a debate about the top 1% versus the 99% in the United States. It's opened the press to that conversation. It's opened a lot of people to that issue, which was not on the horizon at all. And now it's now open. You even get the president in some way trying to ride that horse. Whether or not the movement can go forward is the central question most people are debating. My own sense of it from the people I've talked with, and I've just been spending time on the, talking about the book with various Occupy groups as well as other, other groups, there is a deep preparation thinking about major changes. March 30th, there's going to be a national event in Washington. There's discussions of a big spring offensive. There's a student effort going on. There's talk about a summer effort. I don't think the Occupy movement is at all dead and I think you're going to see a lot more coming from it. So, but that's a judgment from the outside. Uh, let me just add to that. And moreover, it needs people who are not, quote, in the Occupy movement. The key is whether we respond and begin to get aggressive, what Ralph was talking about. So the ball is, again, in our court as well, if you're not in the Occupy movement, there's no way to duck this. The question of individually getting involved in politics is critical. The question about the banking is a very important banking. I, I was really, you know, I usually go for about an hour and they, we squeezed it down. What's really interesting is that there, there is, in North Dakota, there has been since the beginning of the early part of the century, the North Dakota state owns a public bank. It is a socialized bank. There are 15 states now considering legislation to set up state banks. That's another part of what I'm talking about. This kind of thing was not on the horizon. Even more interesting, in the city of San Francisco and several other cities, I just, this is from the Wall Street Journal two days ago, this, there are proposals by the Alder, a couple of guys on the city council to take the deposits, publicly owned money in the city of San Francisco or any city, $2 billion, where do you deposit it? So they want to set up a public bank for the city, not just the state. And that kind of thing is doable and politicizable in many parts of the country. Now, people say these are socialized banks, and they are. The United States has a huge history, which they don't tell you about in, in any of your courses. There are 140 public banks in the United States today. They finance rural agriculture. They finance housing in certain parts. They finance electricity and electrical co-ops. We have the, quote, world bank. It is a public bank. So the demand that we have banks that are public banks for the citizens, for this society, is, a, is, is to say let's do for us what we've been doing for the large corporations and export industries, what we've been doing for agricultural, for agricultural organizations. That is conventional in the United States, and it's time really we begin to make the demand state by state, city by city. Safer, yeah, and they're much, much safer as well. Interesting thing about the city bank, I throw this out again, if you look, if you begin thinking about these things with the eye that we've been looking at them, you find San Francisco also, in the website that I saw this on said, wonderfully, that th th there could be a San Francisco is a world that could work, San Francisco to work. What would a, 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 an alternative San Francisco is possible, raising on the question of possibility. An alternative Washington, is an alternative Cleveland is possible. And what that means is raising up an idea of how we build on all of these practical things. All of this stuff is on the ground now. You can find out about it. One of the websites I want to recommend to you, community-wealth.org. Dash wealth. It surveys what's going on because the press doesn't. These things are available for people to do. So that's a really critical issue. I think it's absolutely true, the question about race. I think the, the racial suppression, a good part of the exploitation in this country, has been on the backs, both black and brown and now Hispanic people. There's absolutely no doubt about it. It's obvious and demonstrable. So the question of building forward in a, in a multiracial coalition is absolutely essential. One of the set of ideas about community wealth ownership, for my own personally, came from Du Bois. In 1934, he proposed a whole set of ideas of cooperative community development processes in the black community. And some of those ideas are here. 
Uh, Ted can tell you about the nature of the community in, in Cleveland, where it's, it, it's a very low-income black community of about $18,000 average family income. Many people who are so-called ex-felons, people who have been one way or another, are working in, these, in, in this industry, and, and it's mainly a black community. But the question of how this goes forward is absolutely central. Um, the question of imperialism comes up as well, and let me, let, me, let me take two parts of it. You mentioned Argentina. People know about the, the take and the takeover of worker-owned companies in Argentina. Uh, now, here's, here's the thing to notice about the take. We've studied that. Those are worker-owned companies, and it's a very interesting explosion of activity in Argentina, for those of you who don't know about it. But they don't have stability unless you can link them to a support system. And in Argentina, the city of Buenos Aires buys products and buys services from many of the worker-owned companies. That's exactly the same model as we're talking about in Cleveland. Community worker-owned cooperatives but some publicly controlled system to give support and stability. Or if you wanted to do it nationally, if we build mass transit rails and we build high-speed high trains in the future, that ought to be a public industry with worker ownership and, con and control as well. The same model, but only larger. So that's a key question. Finally, and I'm sure I haven't covered everything, but let me take it from my point of view, the issue of imperialism. The question I personally, as some of you know, have written a lot about foreign policy in my earlier period. I wrote a, two books on the decision to bomb Hiroshima. Largely related, for those of you who know this history, to a plan for what we now call globalization, which was imperial control in a subtle form. That's part of the, the imperial story of the bombing of Hiroshima. Was, that's a long discussion. But the central issue is what kind of society has an expansionist system that leads to this? And if you push it further and further, how do you come back to the design of a system that's neither capitalist nor socialist or, or state socialist that isn't inherently expansionist? Then you get at the roots, I think, of the imperial forms of one form or another. And if you listen closely to what we're talking about, the designs and models, and it's spelled out more in the book, are in fact beginning to point towards the kind of system that doesn't have to expand for markets and investment, that doesn't require to do that. So part and parcel, for those of you who are taking it deeper into this question, part and parcel of the design questions of what we're talking about is how do you undercut the growth potential that is ecologically destructive, the climate change problems that come from expansion, and the imperial problems that come from the same sources. So you want to deal with that, so you want to deal with that, you are up against systemic questions. And then the question becomes not just what's going to happen out there, but whether we ourselves as Americans have the wherewithal to design and build and rechange re our system so we don't have to do that. So that would be my response there. It's a long discussion, but it's a central question, the imperial and race questions. Thank you. <laughs> Ralph, would you like to add to that? I think the Occupy movement is led by very smart people. The first thing they did was to innovate in ways that this, they learned from the 60s. They did not come forward with identity politics. They didn't say, we're black, we're brown, we're gay, we're this, we're that, and we all need our rights. That's what the genius of the 99% was. As a result, they came forward in a much more unified way, minimized internal d divisions. The second thing they did that was smart was the mic, the, you know, the public mic, uh, which you know, sort of blew the mass media's imagination through the roof, you know? And, and the third thing was they were deliberately general, but everybody knew what they were against. They were against exploitation. They were against mass unemployment. They were against corporate corruption. I mean, all you have to do is look at the signs in, in, in the encampments. And if you want to look at more, the Occupy Wall Street people actually had a list now, they didn't go into real details. Should we tax Wall Street 0.03% or 0.05% or 0.1%? Because they didn't want to get to that level where people would start saying, we want this, we want that, and they'd walk off. It was a functional level of generalized outrage. And of course, the reason why it hit the, the bell is because tens of millions of people didn't have to get specific. They live it every day. They weren't saying, well, we're not going to support these people in the polls or support them in a lot of, of ways until we see their specific agenda. Now, the question is, will they 
bounced back by being evicted. You were talking about evicted. That was probably, except for the rough housing, uh, the rough housing of the police, that was probably the best thing that happened to them with the onset of winter. And because the police in some cities uh, were telling the homeless to go there, they wanted that clash, they wanted that burden. Uh, and so that's stage one, it, it's over. Uh, stage two is now they're looking, uh, for example, in New York, Trinity Church has a big, a big square that's pretty empty. And if they go there, there's no police problem. I mean, they're there with the imprimatur of the owner. Or they will look for a building. Uh, and they're now thinking, I mean, look, they had 5,000 books in the library in Zuccotti Park. 5,000 books. They, had li they have libraries down here. So they're learning the techniques of nonviolent civil disobedience. Remember, apart from the older people who were there, it's not just the young people's effort. But there's a whole generation that was never dragged off by police that didn't know how to do nonviolent disobedience. So there's a real learning problem. Now, just note, note this. This whole effort, which captured the imagination of huge numbers of people in the country and the mass media, was pulled off by 200,000 people. 200,000 people either were in encampments or marched. That's nothing compared to the pool that they can tap into come this spring. Oh, no. Okay. Um, I'm going to walk down here. I did want to add one point on race that um, really is striking in the figures that Gar and Ralph and others have mentioned, which is these movements today in many ways are reactions to 30 years that started with Reagan and Thatcher and Cole and the World Bank and IMF of pushing a model that corporations and the so-called free market will bring us prosperity. People, as you pointed out in the back, have rejected this all around the world and part of what's exciting is they're now rejecting it here. But one thing we've learned in the last three years, we are now three years into a deep crisis that began on Wall Street, is that when that crisis hit and a lot of wealth was wiped out, we learned what many people in this room know, which is that the wealth of African Americans and Latinos in particular was even thinner. So you can take the figures Gar gave and put them through a race lens, and in that crisis, the wealth of much, many African, the majority of African American families and Latino families was destroyed. A middle class was destroyed. People were crashed into poverty. Whereas in the white population, there was more accumulated wealth. Big difference, um, but still, in, in a country as diverse as this country, the suffering is widespread. And, and I agree with Ralph, the 99% is the right slogan, the 99% versus the 1%. Okay, let's take uh, four or five on this side. We'll start in the front and move back. Thank you very much. Um, I had a question about um, resistance because uh, the picture you gave was of this kind of almost organic development of various alternatives. But of course, although the factory bosses may not be there, there are a lot of other people who do very well currently. So if you look, you, you gave the example of the community land trusts, there's a lot of private developers who want to build all the houses they can in the best areas and have no affordable housing in there. We've seen that in Washington DC over the last few years. If you try to develop alternatives, there's resistance from the developers, of course, and then that makes it hard to just have this kind of seamless organic growth, and then you get into a conflict, and I just wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Great. Yeah. yeah, a generation ago in Europe, there was a great deal of interest in workers' control and industry and so on. What happened to that, apart from the Spanish case? Are there any other, or perhaps in Germany, there was some institutionalization of this? Yeah, I'm going to move back, and then I'll come, come up front. Here, hang on. Uh, I'm Greg Squires. I teach at a local university. I'm trying to interest my president and the procurement folks into shifting some of the deposits to smaller institutions uh, and some of the, 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 just the, the business contracts to small businesses, minority-owned businesses within the district here. 
And I'd like to know, Gar, if you've tried something like this in Maryland or if you have any information on other universities that have started to move in this direction. Great. We'll take these two right here. Hi, I'm Martine, and I'm desperate to work for a co-op, if anyone knows of one. <laughs> um, also, in addition to Argentina, uh, huge co-ops happening in Venezuela. I don't know if your book touches on Venezuela at all. And then finally, um, can you talk about time banking? Time banks. Um, I'd like to raise the specter of co-optation. Um, and um, you, you, Gar, you, you referenced the progressive movement several times. And I, if you can, counter it with the populist movement. I mean, the progressive movement did not result in anything resembling the end of capitalism, as we're talking about now. It and the New Deal and the Civil Rights Movement had business support. Um, and, um, you know, are we going to go through this sort of run of the mill of regulation and then getting off of regulation and it just becomes a pendulum and the same basic structure continues? Um, concurrent to that, this, this evening was introduced but with a quote, which I guess was welcoming from Obama. Um, this is, tr you know, to me a transparent attempt to ride this horse, as I think Gar um, mentioned. Um, and I want to know how people are planning to deal with that, because this thing will get co-opted, because, um, you know, the schemers around Obama are correct. You people have nowhere to go. You have no electoral strategy, and you will end up fussing and fussing and end up pushing the button for us. Now, I've outlined a strategy, votepack.org, which says why not team up with conscientious conservatives. Both Ralph and Gar have talked about conscientious conservatives and some guys, that small businessmen. Um, why not team up with them to have something that's an electoral strategy worthy of saying the 99%? I'm sure you guys have nothing to say about that. Let, why don't we, since there's five, let's take these uh, questions now, and then we've got plenty of time for people in the back and another round here. So, Gar, you go first. Uh, I want to, the, there's one question that's at the heart of all this. I'm going to spend most of my few minutes on that because I think it's, it's really centered. But, but the, uh, the question, one of the ways of thinking about the resistance problem and, and response to it is uh, if you think about the United States and think about the the little countries of Europe, I say that, the little countries of Europe, Germany can be dropped into Montana. Here is a continent of 3,000 3, miles. What's happening, one way to think about what's happening is that at the far ends of the internal empire, Cleveland, Detroit, St. Louis, where the pain is greatest at the far ends of the empire, that's where the resistance begins. That's where the new possibility, because the pain levels are so great and because there's no solution. It's the same problem as a global problem, only internal to the system. And that part, that part of it, development, I think, is, it is not, from my point of view, organic. At this stage, it is developmental. It is experimental. It is beginning to get not only projects, but much more important, ideas about what might be done, both in theory what is the structure of ownership if we don't like capital ownership? And how do we build politics around it? That's where we are at this stage in development, preliminary, p political startups. That's the sort of thing that's beginning, and it is at that stage. There should be no, mis no, no misunderstanding of it. But that's a big deal. That has not happened in the United States, that people have that set of ideas. There are many other parts of the European issue. There's co-determination in Germany. There's autodigestion, auto who can say it better, in, was in Algeria. There was an experiment, the Yugoslav model. But what these are is not simply worker participation. In other words, somebody else gets to own it. We're talking about transforming the ownership so that there is either public or quasi-public or local ownership. Changing the who owns capital question is at the heart of this whole discussion we're talking about. And then the question becomes, do people act like, as Ralph said, that we own this country rather than can we maybe regulate, and try to regulate the corporations as they run the main, main operations? So it's a very, it's a transformative issue of who controls rather than simply whether or not we can try to regulate. We did try something at the University of Maryland on procurement. The past president 
everybody else in the hierarchy of the, at the university, we finally got in line to actually do it, and then the president wanted to go in a different direction. But other universities are going to begin that. And one of the interesting questions is whether students force their universities to buy from these kinds of en entities. I think that's a really interesting possibility, as they did with the South Africa issues, changing the ownership, changing the investment patterns of universities. All that is well within the range of possibility. Venezuela, we didn't discuss, but there are 10,000 co-ops in Venezuela, which is a whole, the book does not get into that, but it's obvious and analogous. Time banking is one of the other auxiliary things that's going on locally. That is, people will put in a certain amount of time. I, I'll, I'll cut your lawn if you sew my shirts. That sort of thing is going on in many parts of the country. It's auxiliary to this. But briefly, the thing I really want to talk about is this co-optation problem. A lot of people in the United States and in other countries begin with the assumption they will stop us if we try and never try. My own sense, I'm a historian, my own sense is, one, there is a, always much more of a possibility, including the development of land trusts in many cities where they've won rather than lost. We could go through that in detail. We've got an expert here, Steve Dubb, can tell you about that. There are many situations where the fight has been fought and won, but more interesting, and now I'm going to take just two minutes and I'll sit down on this, one of the really interesting things about this moment of history, in my judgment, briefly put, in the first quarter of the century, we're talking about the progressive era, the American economic system was in stagnation, recession, and almost depression, and was bailed out by World War I. In the second quarter of the century, stagnation, recession, and massive collapse, and was bailed out by World War II. In the third quarter of the 20th century, the Korean War, the Cold War, the Vietnam War kept a major military budget underneath the economy. What is really interesting now when you look at economic stagnation is that the military budget, big as it is absolutely, is declining to 4 and 5 percent of the GDP, not nearly enough to stabilize the economy. My own sense is that stagnation and economic decay of a much deeper and ongoing kind is not the kind that goes away easily. And part of the reason I think there is a, I'm a realist, it is possible that nothing can be done. Okay? Possible they will stop anything. Okay? It is also possible in this context, over time, to seriously begin to build and transform the basis and foundations of the next transformation. I didn't say have a revolution. I said establishing the basis of potentially transformative real politics. My heroes are the heroes, my heroes are the civil rights workers in the 1930s and 40s. They laid the groundwork for what became the movement that succeeded. And I think that's the way I understand this period, the possibility of doing that kind of work in this period is our challenge. Uh, in a choice between Freud and guilt and Jung and shame, I'll take Jung any time. <laughs> we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. Two percent of the people in our country organized with what Abraham Lincoln called the public sentiment behind them can overthrow these corporate regimes. Two percent. It's sort of, I, there's, there's a d little problem with this analogy. When you split the atom, you see the atom, it's just there. Does, has no power. You split the atom. Look at the enormous power. You split the apathy, which is the other side of powerlessness, and people start feeling their power. The eruption of democratic power will overcome these corporate cowards and these corporate predators and these corporate abandoners of our country. Their power comes from our belief that we have no power. That's where their power comes. Once you tear away the reality, they become very, very fragile. Now, this comes down to how indignant we can become bedecked with the facts and a sense of history and a sense of the potential. And how indignant we can become is something you can test your friends with. And I'm sure you've had the same experience we've all had. You relate to them a total corporate outrage, a total corporate criminal dep 
uh, predatory effect against innocent people and powerless people. And they accept your evaluation of it. And then they do nothing. On, on December 16th, we'll be back here with my book called Getting Steam to Overcome Corporatism. And it's a test of the reader as to whether they can move from what's in their brain to fire in their belly to break their routine and band together. So that's what it really comes down to. So try this one on some of your friends. And this is nowhere near as bad as a lot of the examples in this little book. People go to the gas pump and they buy gasoline and they buy home heating fuel. Lee Raymond, the CEO of ExxonMobil, when he retired, he took away $250 million. In the last year he was working, he was making $32,500 an hour, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. Now say that to a friend and, and see whether there's any reaction one or other. Watch the pupils dilate. <laughs> see if there's any heaving of the emotional intelligence, as the psychologists now have termed, fire in the belly, Rosa Parks style, the Flint workers in the 30s in Michigan style. This is what we got to get over with. Think of the assets we have. Think of the assets we own. Why are we letting corporations control our assets? Why do we say to Congress, why don't we say to Congress, why are we giving you so much power? Why are we giving you our power? Why are we giving the corporations all our tax dollars that they're converting into their profits? Why are we giving away our commonwealth? In whatever way you want to phrase it, but we start out with huge assets, as are described in Gar's book and other materials at the bookstore. Huge assets that are latent. They are being, we own, the corporations are controlling our assets. Our gold on the federal lands, if you want a symbol, controlled. And just let you, with one last example. Uh, over 10 years ago, a Canadian gold company, Barrick, came on federal land in Nevada. And under the 1872 Mining Act, their geologists discovered $9 billion of our gold underground. That's with a B. Under the 1872 Mining Act, they went to the Department of Interior, and Department of Interior had to obey the law. They sold the ownership of $9 billion of our gold for $5 an acre, which totaled 30000 bucks. And there are no royalties back to Uncle Sam or us as a result. There's no residual benefit from giving away that gold. It may surprise you that there's no less developed country in the world that has perfected the giving of its natural resources as the USA has perfected. So figure out how you can convey factual indignation. The case is overwhelming. It's what I call arguing with irrebuttable evidence garnished with irresistible rhetoric. Use it. <laughs> now that everyone's pupils are dilated, um, I, I just want to make a very specific comment. This is not like a, uh, this is not some staggering comment, but to a gentleman from the university, um, if you're interested in doing what you said, uh, there is an effort that is beginning with some support here with local philanthropy in Washington to explore an evergreen style development in the Washington DC metropolitan region. And um, Steve Dubb, if you'd raise your hand, uh, Steve and I are doing a feasibility study on that right now, and it's going to involve universities and hospitals and like, so if anyone's interested in talking to us about that, or learning more, uh, if you could give your contact information, Steve. But let me just say these place-based anchor institutions, we tend to think of universities for their mission of creating critical thinkers and education and so forth, and hospitals for healthcare. But they are large economic engines. They're really big businesses in our community. Un universities around the country now have endowments that are invested of nearly $400 billion. Hospitals have endowments that are in invested of over $600 billion. That's over a trillion billion, a trillion dollars 
in these quasi-public institutions that are invested, and how are they invested? Not with any particular lens about how they could help the place in which they're located. They're in hedge funds or wherever they can get the most money. So um, this idea of, of endowments and procurement, where you have hundreds of billions of dollars flowing through these systems, the question of how can we leverage that and capture it for real local community be benefit, uh, to benefit Anacostia. We have an extraordinary network of universities in this community and, in, uh, and hospitals. Are they conducting their business in a way that's really good for the citizens of Washington, D.C.? And so that's what this project is going to be about. Let me just elaborate that. Just footnote on it. Ted mentioned the Evergreen. That's the Cleveland discussion. If it's, that's the same thing. The Evergreen is the Cleveland model. Three trillion dollars a year, local, state, and national uh, governments spend our money on civilian procurement. Uh, Barry Commoner, many years ago, the environmentalist, uh, urged once the Pentagon. They said the Pentagon could have spent a lot of its energy money uh, on solar technology. <clears throat> and created a big civilian market. Well, the Navy uh, 25 years ago started buying photovoltaics for remote locations for economic reasons, not just environmental reasons. So you see, how did we get airbags in cars? The auto companies blocked, at the, at, blocked us at the, at the Department of Transportation. In the mid 80s, I learned that the head of the General Services Administration, Gerald Carmen, was a former auto parts dealer from New Hampshire. If you know anything about auto parts dealer, they have no awe of the auto companies in Michigan. So I went to him and I said, would you like to save the lives of civil servants, of government employees? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you buy 45,000 cars a year, not counting what the Pentagon buys, so why don't you specify airbags? He said, yeah, why not? And that led to the first fleet Ford bid the others knew what was going on, so they didn't want to bid GM Chrysler. Ford bit, and they sold 40-some thousand cars. Then the other companies came in, and then the Department of Transportation finally moved in with its regulatory responsibilities. This is our money. Look at the, tr the worker pension funds, private and public, are own about one-third of the stock of the New York Stock Exchange corporations. But the manage the corporate uh, officers have rigged the system where they strip the shareholders who own them of any power of ownership. They own the companies and management and the corporate rulers control it at the top. Another example of what we own is the corporations control what we own. Now you see how easy this is to turn around once it catches on and once it moves into the political arena and the mass media arena. It's so easy to do. And keep this in mind, 1,500 corporations get their way with a majority of 535 men and women in the Congress who put their shoes on every day like we do. They don't have a single vote, these corporations. We're sitting in the districts saying, oh me, oh my, and uh, rationalizing our futility in cafeterias. It's crazy. Sometimes you, you get a bigger objective by accelerating the urgency and not allowing the opposition to regroup as they did in the 1940s when Harry Truman proposed universal health care. And they had years and years to counterattack, to insinuate, to build up the power. The key is to get the awareness fast and do it with dramatic media fashion the way the Occupy did. Now, they could have had huge rallies that, took three hours, they wouldn't have gotten two articles in the Washington Post. Instead, they were there 24 hours a day. See, it's a different style to the protest. Okay, I'm gonna sit, there's a lot of people behind us up here on the stage, some who've been standing here. Let me see if any of you have any comments or questions. We'll start with the person standing. Hi, I'm Tim. Um, my question is, like, Along the lines of what um, Ralph and Nader were saying, we own trillions in national resources and we sort of give it away because the corporations have better lobbyists than we do. So why not you nationalize those resources, sell them on the market and allow 
um, for smaller com small companies like you're talking about to um, build solar panels or convert us over to the green energy economy. Or another example is if a company decides to move its um, spark plug factory over to China, uh, the workers could apply for a loan through a bank that is financed by our own natural resources and, oh, you know, own that production capacity, which is usually profitable, but it's not as profitable as a company in China or so something. Thank you. Uh, right here. Thanks. Uh, uh -oh. I see why everybody's wanting you to run for president. Um, I had a couple questions. I wanted to uh, ask about why cooperatives are demonized in some communities and what can be done to overcome that. And um, I've also watched quite a few of your videos, uh, Gar. And uh, if you can comment a little bit on Christianity and socialism, how those two uh, work together. Uh, my name is Mike Golash, and uh, I'm a former transit worker, union activist. This is uh, the librarian at Occupy DC. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my, when I came to this uh, talk, I read the headline, America Beyond Capitalism. And to me, I thought that meant we want to get rid of the capitalist system. We want to get us rid of a system which allows private exploitation of workers, stealing surplus value from workers either by individuals or by the government which is run by private capitalists. Rather, you know, rather what I've heard, and then getting rid of that system, which means going to a society which is based on collectivity, which is fighting for a classless society, that sort of communist vision that we once had. Instead, I've heard of ways we're going to try and tinker with the system of capitalism, try and make it a little less exploitative, and somehow uh, keep it going for another few generations. I'm for ending capitalism once and for all. Before we take one more, I just want to say, if you want to support both the Occupy movements and the bookstore out here, buy some books. Don't, don't give them to Mike, because then he'll have to carry them down to the library. But bring them down to the library at McPherson Square. We'll take one more from the stage. Can women have a chance? Sure. We'll take, we'll take, yeah, we'll take two here. Yeah. How about the stairs? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, stairs. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Emmett Abati Doe, and uh, as of last night at a Venezuelan function, there are 38,000 active co-ops co in Venezuela. Uh, but I wanted to say is that what uh, seems to be missing is an awareness of what capitalism and capitalists have done uh, to the nation state of Libya, and they had done what y'all are talking about doing. So it seems to me that there seems to, that there needs to be uh, a recognition that uh, the boys who control Wall Street play hardball and that what I've heard tonight is, is pretty milquetoast. Hi, I'm Kathy Boylan and um, I'm, I got a moral question. Uh, uh, you said something about the uh, defense budget is 4%, whatever, reduced n amount of the gross national product. Uh, but it's 61% of the federal budget. And, um, you know, while we're talking about all of these advances in, you know, improving our life, we've killed a million and a half, more than that, a million and a half Iraqis over the last 20 years. And we've paid for it. We've paid for torture, horrible things. So what is the moral obligation to refuse to pay the taxes and give the money instead to the worker-owned cooperative or that's going to make solar energy and uh, do all sorts of good things? But we're, we're so responsible for so many people suffering, Argentina, everywhere in the world. Thank you. Okay, I'll start with you right after this set of questions. Uh, Gar. The conversation is getting interesting now. <laughs> the, um, first, I, I very much like this. I, what's really interesting about your suggestion is once you begin to think this way, 
why, why don't we why don't we take over these companies? They're leaving, they're productive companies, why not the workers buy the, the suggestion here, the spark plug suggestion? Almost everywhere you look around, that possibility becomes, why don't we do this and people can begin to, begin to act on it. Uh, I don't know if co-ops are demonized. Some parts of the country they are, some parts of they, they aren't. Um, I come from a part of the country where co-ops are conventional, Wisconsin. So there are other people who may have a better answer in some, in some parts, than, and Ralph may know more about this than I do. Um, let me talk about the, the tinkering question and the capitalist question that, that's really here that uh, raised in different ways. So here's how here's it goes. The, the question is, if you're interested in transforming who owns and runs the system, do you have a path? Do you have a path which is both political and serious and also does not lead to a centralized state that takes over the power that you have begun to develop. Now that's a central question of all revolutionary history. This, the question that most of the traditional socialist argument has been about collapse of the system, some kind of revolution in Marxist theory, and a concentrated state which is then in control of large-scale capital and tends then to be not democratic. It's a very nasty question. So the problem of what the state looks like, if you don't want that state, what is your process? It's a, it's a central question for anybody who raises this kind of rhetoric or begins to challenge the system. The argument that's being made that I'm making and the argument of the book is that this particular corporate capitalism is in a situation not of collapse, but not of reform. It's in decay and stagnation. And it offers the opportunity for people to actually learn by doing some of the principles in a very decentralized basis. Ultimately, in my view, the large ownership patterns, as I say in my book, are going to have to change. But the question is whether, in fact, the process leads to a democratic solution or a non-democratic solution. And I don't think people have faced that. I think if you're serious about it, You've got to ask your question, is there a way forward in the particular historical circumstances we're facing? And what the argument of this book is that because of the nature of where we are, the particular establishment, building from the bottom up, state by state within the internal empire is the precondition of a longer transformation. I think this period is about that process, not about taking over in some sudden form. And I'm, I put it to you directly, people who have that other view, do you have an answer to the question of how do you avoid takeovers of the state that become even more democratic unless you build a process and something's appropriate to this country? So that's a contention. And it's really something that I ur urge, not simply as my view, but people who care about this to begin to grapple precisely with this debate that's implicit in the questions and also argued in the book. You got to love busboys and poets. <laughs> you come here, you come here, and we talk about mass displacement of global corporations with community economies, banks, energy companies, healthcare dynasties, chains, etc. You come here and you talk about taxpayers taking control of their money which have been given up to corporations to enrich themselves and then build companies that exclude them from health care or affordable prices in general. You come here and you talk that if you control what we already own as a massive commonwealth of wealth, that you will build the political power to take over Congress and state legislators and smash the empire overseas, and end the military industrial complex, and you're accused of milk toast. <laughs> uh, I could imagine some of you want to join in that. We're going to take one more from the stage, and then take, I'll come back up here and back up here. Here you go. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Bob. I would like to follow up to one comment that was made by the uh, faith-based person in the audience who spoke about 
uh, the lack of participation by minorities in Occupy Wall Street. I have participated in marches for Wa Occupy Wall Street, not because I am hurting economically in any way, but mainly because of, of the underlying causes that I, I, I see and support uh, for other people and not for me. When I do participate in the marches, I wonder, because I see the unemployment numbers in the District of Columbia and how they are different for minorities versus non-minorities. And I wonder, where are the minorities in these marches? What can we, the people here who are leaders, including the person who spoke up from the faith-based community, and the other leaders in this audience, including those who are with Occupy Wall Street, how can we get the minorities involved in these movements, including this post-capitalist movement? Uh, one step that has been made is by Occupy Judaism K Street. They have held meetings at their initiation of faith-based leaders to get them involved in Occupy Wall Street and to get other of their members involved. So what can be done? Okay, I'm going to come down here. What, let me mention, Ralph mentioned his event on the 16th. So please come back, this same bus boys, on the evening of the 16th for Ralph's new book. Another book I just want to mention where this conversation can also continue is on the 18th, uh, we at the Institute for Policy Studies are hosting Harry Belafonte, uh, who has a new book, who's thought about this issue, and he'll be the entire restaurant in this room will be opened up to a conversation with Harry about his book uh, at 5 p.m. on the 18th. Here you go, and then I'm going to come back down to you there on the floor. Well, Ralph, I'm with Occupy Freedom Plaza, and I'm from the south side of Chicago. I'm from Hegwish, and my friends asked me to come out to say that many of them have voted for you, Many of them have been voting for you since 2000 because they are the sons and daughters of steel workers and they, and they are, they are anti-corporate. They have, I was lucky enough to go to college. Many of them have not been. I'm here particularly on the behest of a woman um, named Arlene Gendak, who is a daughter of a Polish immigrant, has a GED, who loves you who has been on every one of your campaigns, and many of us who are college educated, like me who went to Wisconsin and Penn, think people like this are all about the elite, but they wanted me to come out and say that they really feel that you have been representing them for the past 10 years. Tell her, tell her Dobra. Um, hi, my name is Patricia and I go to Georgetown University. I'm with a group of my friends and we decided to come here because um, this is a very interesting topic for all of us. And I have a question about the political system and the way that elections run in the US. Um, you're, always talk you're not talking about upsetting the system, you're talking about changing it and tinkering with it so that we can make it more um, equitable and better for everybody. But what do you propose in terms of working with the, democ the democratic system here. So do you propose having a third party? Because the way that it works here is that it's bipartisan. And for example, Ralph Nader's um, 2000 election, he took, it's like people criticize you for taking away the votes from the Democrats and stuff. And I don't, I think that that's, that's ridiculous because if you have a better, if you have a better alternative and a better vision for this country, how is it that the system impedes you from winning or from having power, and that's the way that people view things. I just, I really want to see your take on that. Thank you. You've been patient down here. Hi. Um, I would, I've been trying to fit these two things together for a long time. I come from the climate movement. So you talked about the first quarter economic collapse, stagnation, World War I, second quarter, World War II, third quarter, Korea, Vietnam, fourth quarter, where we are today. Could, I feel that in addition to the stagnation and the economic collapse, what is going to help, help bring change 
is that we are in a biological collapse, we are in climate collapse, and that those new pressures... So could you talk about that from the social... I mean, and like, when are we going to... I mean, I, I'm so excited about the anger over our... our who owns our wealth, but who owns our bodies? Who is poisoning our bodies? Who owns our climate? Who is ruining our climate? So those other two factors. Okay, one more here. I'd like to say something about the transformational issue and the need for education. Because impassioned people really get it, but very smart people, I think have a problem in operationalizing it. Example, in one part of my life, I belong to a glass blowing studio. Now these people are smart, they're artists, they're professors, but they don't really know how to do it. And I, I, that's why I think a lot of education needs to take place. So, the guy who owns the place said, uh, you guys have to figure this out. I, I don't wanna be the owner, I don't wanna be the head of this anymore, form a co-op. Not a co-op, figure out how to do it. These smart people who've been brainwashed into thinking that they need a leader really didn't know how to do it. And I'm not saying they, I'm included. We all looked at him like, what do you mean? You're not gonna be in charge? How does that work? What are we gonna do? Now, in maybe a year, people have come together and tried to figure out some ideas of how to make that happen, but I think that they're very bright people. I mean, I occupy people know how to do it. You guys, people in the room know how to do it. But there are people who would want to do it, but they don't really have any clues. So to operationalize it, I, I think that's an issue. And I think some education needs to take place, like a lot of it. Thanks. OK, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, well, Ralph already thanked you, but just before I turn it back to you, um, Andy Shalal, uh, who made that comment, <laughs> and who invited us to stay a bit longer, uh, is the creator of this place, the creator of this mural, and of other Bus Boys and Poets. And if you want to learn more about it, there will be a piece on... Uh, Andy will be on the cover of the Washington Post magazine this Sunday. We hope it'll be a good article. <laughs> But you can learn more there. But thank you for supporting Bus Boys, and thank you for supporting the bookstore in a few minutes when you, uh, when you get the book. Uh, Gar. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just try to deal with, uh, or at least respond to two questions. One, the, um, the question about climate and commodities. You're absolutely right. That is to say, there is an additional set of issues having to do not only climate change, but also commodities, oil and energy and wheat and the commod that are pressuring in. So I think, and we didn't talk enough about that, but, you, but we need to address it. The thing I want to really um, open up and, and I want to challenge folks and respond, because when I mean challenge, I want to drop a problem in your lap, because it's our problem, it's not my problem. So it's, it's this, if you, if you think about what we're talking about here, we are not simply talking about an election. We're talking about a social movement that is a long, struggling, building process that has really decades of protest, anger, sit-ins, the construction of new strategies, the building up of the basis of transformation. That's the name of the game. The content is different. We've been living with, up till now, we've been living in the modern era with hoping you can tax and regulate the corporations while they control the action. One of the things that's also happened is with the decline of the labor movement, was 34% of the labor force, it's now 6% in the private, 6.8% in the private sector. That power to help regulate is declining. So the next politics is either gonna build a new institutional base, including the kind of stuff we're talking about here, and a different vision not to regulate, but actually to take over and build up a new America beyond capitalism. Now, if you look at it that way, so you know, this is not my problem. This is our problem, and I want to drop it in your lap. There either is a process that builds steadily the knowledge, the politics, 
the understanding, the power of the moral power, the issue of the churches, all together that slowly begin to recreate a new sense of possibility, or there's no way forward. So that is the challenge. So I, the word tinkering is I, it's really kind of interesting to me. I re reacted with Ralph. The name of the game, and if you read the book, the name of the game is large-scale transformation of the system. And it's all about that. But the question of what is the process? So let me give you just a small piece of language, because I've run into the same discussion many, many times. What we have been doing mostly so far is attempting to, quote, reform. What does that mean? You allow the power to stay where it is in the corporate hands, and you attempt to hedge it in by regulation and taxation. But you don't change the power structure. You try to hedge it. The alternative is, quote, revolution, a massive, violent overthrow of the, and capturing the means of, the product, of production. That's, quote, revolution. I think we're in a stage which best describes, it's neither one of those. You've got to think newly. I think the best formulation is what might be called evolutionary reconstruction, the steady buildup of institutions and knowledge and politics and social movement and, and power and individual action and understanding of what it is we're after. If you don't like capitalism and you don't like state socialism, how do you transform and democratize the ownership over time? So that the challenge to all of us is, is there both a vision that is democratic really, that doesn't come up with problems of the Soviet Union. Really, is there a vision that gets beyond corporate capitalism trying to regulate it? And is there a process over time building, as in the 30, 40 year process of the populists and the progressives, that could get us to the stage where real transformation would happen? That's our problem, that's not my problem. So I urge you to think about a, something different from the traditional models, one that both builds evolutionarily but also transforms pushing back the margins to a place where there's enough understanding and enough politics, enough politics so we elect guys like Ralph rather than have him you know, coming with us tonight. We want you president. Um, just to amplify this a bit, uh, there, are, there are huge zones in this country where you can get what Gar is talking about by organizing community. And, and we've talked about a lot of that. I mean, Nobody can really stop us at the community level of getting credit cooperatives and farmer markets and more energy and more community clinics and so on and so forth. But on the big issue of change, when the rubber hits the road, if the corporations own our government and turn it against us, we're not going to be able to break through. So the more community power there is, the more political power there'll be to elect people locally and then better people state and then better people nationally. But make no mistake about it. How many more generations are we gonna give this two-party dictatorship an opportunity to prove how bad they can run America into the ground? We have to break this two-party tyranny. And, and the only people who are gonna break it are the gullible or powerless or on the side voters. The hereditary voters who trudge to the polls because their grandparents are Republican, Democrat, and they'll vote for whoever is on that ticket. Bloomberg once said he didn't run, he didn't run for president because his surveys show a third of the people would vote Republican if the nominee was Leon Trotsky. <laughs> and, if, and, and the other people would vote for the Democrats if the nominee was Ayn Rand. So you have the hereditary voter, automatic, Democrat, Republican. Then you have half the voters who stay home. Ah, pox on all your houses, as if they don't pay a price for that. And then you have the rest of the voters with a tiny sliver that goes for third party independent candidates who want to be with the winner. They want to be the winner. I was in a cab. Uh, after the 2000 election in Kansas, going to a school, and the driver spent 20 minutes telling me how much he supported me and the agenda and the Green Party and all that. And this was Republican Kansas, slam dunk state, Republican. So I said, oh, well, that's great. Well, thank you for your vote. He said, uh, and you know, I love these phrases, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> 
to be perfectly honest, he says, I was going to vote for you until I got into the voting booth and something came over me that said, vote for a winner. <laughs> so he voted for the Democrat, who was preordained to lose anyway in Kansas, right? This business of wanting to be with a winner, there's no tactical sense to the vote. There's no conscientious vote. You vote your conscience. You vote your conscience. You don't simply say, well, I don't want to vote my conscience because that's a wasted vote. But, uh, because I don't know whether many other people are going to vote their conscience. This idea of the Greens took votes away from the Democrats. Wait a minute. If the voters voted to the, for the Greens, why did the Democrats own those votes? I don't quite get the logic. And didn't Bush win and steal more votes from Gore than the Green Party? I mean, you see, it's in our minds. We've got to get rid of the cobwebs here. And the only, and the, as, as O'Donnell, who's on cable now, only said on MSNBC, I guess, he said in, in one documentary, he said the only, less, the only message that politicians understand is when you take the vote away from them and put it in the line that you want it. And yet we're, we've got these cobwebs. And that's why you're not going to get other than a multi-billionaire running on a third party like Perot. Because they've got the system so rigged with ballot access barriers and harassment and no debates, etc., that no one else can, can do it. Believe me, I, I've tested it. <laughs> I've, every state campaigned in every state, 2000, 2004, 2008. Then at the beginning of all the campaigns, run, Ralph, run. And I say, I'm running. And then I look back, and there's nobody there. <laughs> except a few faithfuls, a few supporters, a few dynamos. So it's, it, there's one we cannot, you know, we cannot blame some power force. Here's, a, here's what it comes down to. How much time are will, we willing to put in the pursuit of justice? That, that's what it comes down to in our daily life. If we are so overwhelmed by feeling powerless that we have no time to build our power, if we're so overwhelmed by the injustice on our lives that we have no time to pursue justice, if we are so overpowered by the plutocratic reign of terror on this country and the rest of the world that we don't have time to pursue democracy, the ball game's over. How much time? That's the key. How much of a piece of the 24 hours and the seven day week and the 30 or 31 day month are we going to devote to our civic responsibilities and our political duties. And, and you want to talk to your friends, just ask them, how much time do you spend? How much time do you spend on a democratic and just society and world? That's, that's where you get the first key. Without time, no talent. Without talent, no skills, no emotional intelligence, no sense of injustice, etc. Everything follows from how we slice up our time. And if we're so busy trying to get through the day because of all that we talk about, then we don't have time to get out of it. And we'll be trapped. OK, I want to I wanna pick up on one thing that just was in that last round. And then we'll have time for one final round of questions. Ralph talked about the two parties. And if you looked at the economic debate even three years ago in this country, it was largely Republicans saying, deregulate corporations, that's the route to prosperity. Democrats saying, we can grow our way out of this mess. That was the debate. Now I think as our friend who raised the issue of climate said, two huge crises have come down on us, which I think open up. I think what Gar and Ralph and Ted and all of us are saying is we're in a different moment now. The climate crisis forces us to think about growth in the economy differently. The collapse of Wall Street forces us to think about the economy differently. Can our movements bring these things together in a transformative vision of a new economy that is, has ecological balance, is more equitable, and is democratic? That's 
the question that's posed. And I just want to note, I, I work at the Institute for Policy Studies. We're three blocks from Occupy DC. It was a fascinating just snapshot at our movements between November 3rd and November 6th. So I'll just say, but it, it raises the challenge. November 3rd, Ralph and others joined 2,000 nurses rallying at the Treasury Department against uh, Tim Geithner under the slogan, Tax Wall Street, Tax Timmy's Friends. So that was Thursday. Friday, from Occupy DC, people marched to the DC Convention Center where the Koch brothers were hosting a dinner for Mitt Romney and Herman Cain. Saturday, 650,000 people in this country moved their money from big banks to local banks. And then on Sunday, Bill McKibben and others surrounded the White House on climate. And what I was watching for is I wanted to see how much overlap there was, in particular between the climate one saying we need a different green economy and the others saying we need an economy for the 99%. And I want to report there were a lot of people at all of them. There is more overlap. There is more of a sense. There's been a historic division in this country between the labor movement and the environmental movement. And in this new space, people are breaking that down and are putting forward a more integrative vision. So I endorse this uh, sense of possibility. Some of us are working, Gar and others of us have put together something called the New Economy Working Group. It has a website, New Economy Working Group. Org, and a lot of the ideas we've been talking about are there, and a, a lot are on that community-wealth.org website that Ted mentioned. Okay, one last round of comments. Um, here we go. Hi, um, my name is Lucia. I'm also a student from Georgetown, and I'm from Argentina. And one of the things that shocked me a lot when coming to the U.S. was uh, that the healthcare system is private and that not everyone that can pay for healthcare can have healthcare and just as education like if you have the money you can get it but if you don't and that shocks me a lot in such a country that's so developed and I don't understand why education and healthcare services that have to be for everyone they have to be businesses and this leads to another question I have like capitalism leads to having um, leads people to have individualist mentalities and how do we get to change this? How do we get to the 1% to get them to understand that the, that the welfare of the 100% is better than the welfare of only them? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. In one of his earlier comments, Gar talked about, warned against creating a cooperative and then the risk that it would grow and, and then all that might happen. I'm wondering if he's familiar, I'm sure he is, with Dr. Herman Daly and the steady state economy. And is it integrated into your book or is it part of, okay, this is what we've got to do? Because I feel, well, I'm, I believe obviously without that, we're just going back to where we were. So, Hi, my name is David. I've just got a question about the scale of the problem that we're facing, particularly when, it, when you look at something like unemployment. Right, Co-ops, according to the pamphlet, currently employ 850,000 people. Uh, we have a, a, a really large unemployment problem right now. Um, and it, so what is your vision, I guess, to, uh, in a nutshell, uh, to deal with the scale of the unemployment problem? What's your, what is your strategy to use this, the uh, principles you've outlined to achieve full employment? So I get, because I think one of the critiques you might get from some folks is, wait a minute, is this really going to get this, uh, uh, tackle the scale of the problem that we have? Great. Thank you. Good evening. I wanted to go back to the point that you made in the beginning about the concentration of wealth because I really was inspired by some of the ideas in moving forward and transforming the system, but I wanted to see if you could attack the issues in the current system in terms of the concentration of wealth. Because 
one of the issues we're having right now is, you know, almost $14 trillion were sucked out of the system during the recession. And a lot of the money got moved to the 1%, which is, you know, why Barack finally talked about it yesterday. So my issue really stands with, you know, what do you do with that quote you had in the beginning about, you know, 70% of all investments in the United States of America are concentrated in the top 5%. So that money's gonna sit there. Even when you build your co-op and you, you really work in your community and so forth, some of it's gonna get moved. But a lot of it is sitting in hereditary hands that will continue to control corporate interests. And, and finally, just to piggyback on that, could you also explain how, how your ideas work around um, this issue of, of the concentration of wealth, you know, kind of stuck, keeping the system stuck? Right, you know, if we don't get rid of Citizens United, if we're continuing to have corporate interests by our politicians, um, we're, you know, in other words, if the wealth is concentrated and they keep it in their hands, you know, you're going to still have this issue of 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 concentration of power. Thank you. Okay, one more, and the yeah, very back. We've been neglecting the back. <laughs> Um, okay, so I guess I had a question about um, the issue that was brought up earlier in terms of democratizing the means of production. Um, the way I see it, business institutions are essentially means of production. They, they produce things in society and that uh, what is produced is organized through market mechanisms. Um, so my question was if, if you wanted to move Occupy from the public sphere into the workplace, um, if you wanted to have some way to democratize those institutions to occupy the workplace and say, you know, this is a democracy now, we can fire our boss, we can elect our boss. Um, you have new values enter into this, these institutions because um, now it's a democracy, it's not a capitalist institution with, which, with one value which is just profit and that's it. Um, so now you do have that except it occurs in the industrial sphere and not the state. So you don't have this problem of what do we do with the state. Thanks. Uh, in order to give you the last word, Gar, why don't we start with Ted, who's going to solve the unemployment problem. Uh, start with Ted and then Ralph and then end up with Gar. Yeah. So, Ted. Uh, I'll defer to Ralph and Gar. Please. You can't solve the unemployment problem? <laughs> Let's uh, address the person from Argentina. Uh, people come from countries that are far less endowed than ours, and they have universal health care. For example, Taiwan has universal health care. Um, our ally in the Middle East, Israel, has universal health care and still getting $3 billion or more a year from the U.S. taxpayer. And, and of course, there are other countries. Uh, you know, this is surprising. You discover them all the time. It is considered... A, uh, one barrier against a, a, an uprising, not, not to give people health care. Now, in the United States, the corporate supremacist who control the society define what is impermissible violence and what is sub silentio permissible violence. They define impermissible violence as that which they are not responsible for like terrorism or street crime, which they don't think they're responsible for indirectly. And permissible violence that gets very little media attention, very little prosecution, very little safety resources, represent the huge bulk of preventable violence in this country, but it's permissible and not attended to by the forces of, of our democracy, they're not attended to because it traces back to the corporation. For example, 65,000 people dead a year from air pollution, EPA figures. 58,000 workers die every year from workplace-related illness or trauma, OSHA figures. 100,000 people die every year from negligence in hospitals. Another 100,000, according to the Centers for Disease Control,
from hospital-induced infections. And 800 people every week die, according to the Harvard Medical School researchers in peer-reviewed study. 800 Americans every week die, over 100 today, because they cannot afford health insurance to get diagnosed and treated in time. And of course, tens of thousands more are sick or injured. Now that adds up to just under 45,000 people who die because we have a pay or die health industry. We have a pay or die health industry in the land of the free, land of the brave, home of the free. Imagine that. And that's why people from countries outside, they go, what the heck is going on here? What are these American people made of? They kick ass all over the world with special forces and drones and aircraft carriers and 1,500 bases. And when they come back home, they're like patsies to Aetna and United Healthcare and Merck and Pfizer. Huh? So, and I'll bet you there are hardly anybody in this room who doesn't know a friend, neighbor, or relative that died but from, from some mysterious infection in the hospital. See? That's 200 to 250 a day, according to the Centers of Peace Corps. And now they're finally focusing on it a little bit. They're getting the doctors and nurses to wash their hands more frequently, and that's reducing some of the infection. So it comes back down to who defines what is impermissible violence and who defines what is permissible violence. That's one of the consequences of concentration of power in the few at the expense of the many. Hundreds of thousands of Americans die every year from preventable trauma and diseases due to corporate abuse, neglect, greed, you name it. And that's the reason. We don't have the kind of breakthrough. We lost it in the Truman years when we could have got it. We lost it in the Johnson years when they, Medicare and Medicaid came, but the rest, they didn't get universal health care. And now we have this hooked up, overly complex government guarantee of the health care industry to expand the coverage to some millions of people. We didn't have that one push because we weren't, we did, we, we bought this market nonsense. We bought this sink or swim on your own nonsense. I don't know any corporations who swing, swing, sink or swim once they achieve a certain size, right? Why go bankrupt when you can go to Washington? American Airlines just went bankrupt in order so, so it goes to Washington has the taxpayer guarantee the pension money, not to mention other freebies. So, what you need to do is beat up on us from abroad. You gotta say, what is this? It's ridiculous. Ridicule us. Subject us to global contempt. Shame us. You know, we, we are so screwed up as a, 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 as a superpower that I guarantee you if Osama bin Laden announced years ago that he was gonna increase the number of hospital infections that are fatal and the number of occupational deaths that we would mobilize the entire society around this. <laughs> Back years ago when the communists were the big menace, I would say to students around the country, it's too bad that pollution is not the result of a communist a conspiracy. <laughs> I mean, the FBI, is, you know, everybody would swing into action here. <laughs> what we need is we're getting, too, we're getting too free a ride from foreign observation. Hillary Clinton goes around and threatens countries if you don't become a fake democracy, you know, you're going to get drones and Pakistan and this. No one comes here and says, hey, what about your political prisoners in jail? What about your rigged elections in jail? What about your smashing third party challenges in jail? What about you putting the government up for sale or auction here? So help us. Reverse the Monroe Doctrine. <laughs> New bumper
That's a, Ralph's a tough act to follow. <laughs> so let me, let, me, let me, but let me follow it a couple. There was a question back here which I didn't answer, and I want to toss it out here. And because uh, the question is, do you mind addressing the question of uh, Christianity and the capitalism? Well, socialism. and socialism. Yeah, and there was a, so the question. I, since I am not a Christian, since, but I would love to be a rabbi or a pope or something like that. This issue used to be central, and if you read the new encyclicals coming out of the, the Vatican, they are very interesting. There's a whole tradition in, that's very supportive of a very different order that could be drawn upon. Now, the, the American Catholic bishops tried that in the late 80s, and since then they haven't been present. But there is a, for those of you who are active in these communities, there is a powerful tradition that could be built forward and developed. So I urge you to you know, take it on. Don't let it, what Ralph was saying, don't let it sit there. You know, here's the test. Ralph was talking about time. So here's the test. Now, again, I'm talking to individuals. Will you spend one hour differently next week? See, that's what it's about. Even one hour to get into this game. Now, the second thing I want to say is, look at the conversation we're having tonight. This is part and parcel of what we're talking about. Something is what the occupations have shown people is something they sensed, but they've made, it, they've made it manifest, that there is something profoundly wrong. When that happens in a system, when that happens in a society, the beginnings of possibility occur. When people begin to say, hey, this, something's really wrong here. Now, that's the beginning. The question is whether or not we can make that a step forward, but it is a big deal. This kind of conversation is taking place in other parts of the country, and more of it is possible, and it begins, it's a very American conversation. That's what I think is important about it. Third thing I want to say, just in terms of this question of, of uh, income and wealth, you know, a Keynesian economist like Paul Krugman could run this system, or it's you could run this system at high employment. They know what to do. You can do major investments. You could put it into housing and hospitals and schools, get full employment. If you want to think about, I had, you know, someone came up to me and said, we've got this big economic problem with the deficit. It is absolutely not an economic problem. It is a political problem about how to manage the economy. You want to think about that? Anytime you want to run a war, we're at full employment, boom, no problem. Politics supports it. The economists can do that. The question of this rich system is how we transform the political power relationships that manage all that. This system today is producing $200,000 a year for every family of four. And it's obviously being distributed in a radically inequitable way. So the technology, it's a very rich system. Yeah, this society is currently is producing roughly $200,000 a year for every family of four right now give or take, depending upon which year. It's, that's the level of production. It's a very rich system. And we're talking about how that's get allocated and whether there's a, a path forward. So the argument that's coming out here was there, the beginning place of a new possibility is in discussions like this, including, can we, is this tinkering or is there reform or can you regulate the guys? That conversation is the beginning point of a social movement possibility, not an inevitability but a possibility. So that is, what I think, what, what the heart of this. And I don't want to take away from that, but let me just say one further thing about the, the ultimate question here, is that wealth power that we're talking about? So if you take the healthcare system, all right, they, got, they control Washington, but there are now 15 states that are beginning to try to do single payer and try to move in that direction, state by state by state, and when that power accumulates and take over the damn thing nationally, that's the external, the states are the external part of the internal empire building forward. That's another possibility. Bank by bank by bank and then national. Those kind of questions are what we're talking about, not simply tinkering on the edges, but building up knowledge and power and actual practical experience on the ground that can translate into politics over time. Now, if, if you want to, you don't play this game if you want to just think, get elect just the next politician. We're talking about a social movement that has content and ideas, has confronted the problem of state socialism. The conservatives were right about that. Put all the power in the state, with all the economic power, you end liberty. So what is an alternative that is American and how do you build forward on that possibility? 
I think when the next crisis comes financial, I, I don't know one financial expert, left, right, or center, who doesn't predict another banking crisis. When that happens, we will break up those big banks. Then they will regroup. And then the question that the next crisis will be, how do we take them over? So there are questions over time of whether we have begun to think through strategies and build the moral basis of a different vision. And the starting point, I want to take it back to the things we talked about originally and what Ted was talking about. The starting point is, can we, very simple, do we look at the actual communities in which we live, the Clevelands, and begin to say, what would it look like here? Is it tinkering or is it co-ops that begin to add up? Yes, if you added the economic power, you wouldn't have 75,000. You would have large numbers of people throughout the community. They would be ecologically solid. They would be dealing with democratic processes. Community, it's a community-sustaining vision, a community-sustaining economy, a democratized community-sustaining economy. That's the kind of picture. The final question, the climate change and the growth and the Herman Daly question, it is absolutely central. These corporate capitalist systems, all capitalist systems, must grow. And it's not about good guys and bad guys. If you don't grow and your competitor grows, they'll take your market away. You must grow. And that is up against the question of resources and climate. So beginning to develop stabilizing systems, like the little one in Cleveland, or planning systems, is part and parcel of it. But that requires changing the ownership and changing the patterns and changing the profit motive, changing that whole pattern. So if, you're in, if you come at it from climate change, we must begin to think through what it actually takes. So let me finally start here. Here, here I'm a, a writer and you know, I write books and so forth. I think most points in history, ideas don't matter a damn. Momentum matters and power matters. But sometimes, sometimes when everything's going wrong, then the beginnings of thinking through the alternative, both the vision, both what you can do on the ground, and a process becomes our responsibility. And I think that's the time now. So if there's going to be an America beyond capitalism, and I think that is a real possibility over time, worth a fight, and in any case, we'll build something positive on the way, now's the time to really get serious about what we want and where we're going. So thank you very much. So I, I think on behalf of all of us here in the audience and up here on the stage, we, we want to thank these three guys, Ted Howard, Ralph Nader, Garel Perovitz. They are what my IPS colleague Mark Raskin here calls public scholars. They do the research, they do the writing, but they're out creating activism and creating change. So Gar is going to stay up here on the stage, and you can do your holiday shopping and get his book at the bookstore and bring it up here, and he'll sign it. And I encourage you all to occupy this space, have a beer, have something to eat. There are a number of people here from the Democracy Collaborative. There's Noel Ortega, who's live streaming this event, is with the New Economy Working Group, and they'd love to tell you more about what they're doing. And I think Andy Shalal wants the final word. Please, just a minute. I just want to say one thing about Andy Shalal. I have labeled him as democracy's restaurateur. <laughs> and I will add that he's Iraq's gift to America. I'm waiting for America's gift to Iraq. We haven't seen it yet, but we'll, we'll, we'll wait. We've got a long ways to go. But anyway... Uh, this is just a logistical thing because we have, uh, you know, a wonderful full house here. Uh, rather than get, having Gar up there because we have people going up and down stairs, I think it may not be the safest thing to do. We normally put them, the, uh, the signers over here. So we'll have Gar sit at this table. Hey, Mark, how are you? Uh, so we'll put, hi. Andy, how are you, Lynn? introduce Mark. Really, need, yes. really should be introduced. This is Mark Raskin, of course, right there, and his lovely wife, Lynn. And Mark Raskin, of course, with the Institute for Policy Studies, one of the founders. And Anne Barnett is back there, too. She is the wife of Mr. Barnett, who was also another founder of the Institute for Policy Studies. It's wonderful to have everybody here. Such great gathering. Wow. Uh, anyway, uh, we're going to do the signing right here where Mark is sitting. Uh, and uh, we'll have Gar come down here. 
the way we do it is you get the books from the bookstore and we line up along this, this path right here, along the mural. And then you come here, you get the signature and you walk out this way. The bookstore, I don't know if this spiel was done earlier, it's a nonprofit. Every penny you spend in that bookstore goes 100% to support Teaching for Change and all the wonderful things they do. So please, please don't go to Amazon and buy your book tonight. Buy it here and make sure you get it signed today by Gar. Thank you so much for being here. Great. 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 Great